there are a few places in the world that are different from the rest. More beautiful, richer, more spectacular, wilder. They're natural sanctuaries, hot spots where life prospers in an exuberant way. But they're also delicate enclaves whose very existence is threatened. Many of these paradises have been seriously damaged, or they're on the brink of disappearing altogether, in large part because of human progress. We have to preserve them. We should be able to continue to observe them, to enjoy them, but without condemning those who live around them to poverty. and 15 million people live in Brazil. A third of the country's land is dedicated to agriculture and ranching. But above all, Brazil is a country with enormous natural riches. And today, that's synonymous with tourism and therefore progress, economic potential. Brazil has also become a synonym for the Amazonian forest a super ecosystem that is home to the greatest biodiversity in the world. But there's another great ecosystem close to the Amazon, which although it's not as impressive in size, is just as significant in terms of biological value. It's the Pantanal. This other large ecosystem is located mostly in the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso do Sul, although it also reaches west into Bolivia and stretches northeast into Paraguay. The Pantanal is the largest wetlands on the planet. It's a gigantic pool that each year is drained during the dry season and fills up, sometimes even to the point of overflowing, in the rainy season. It's a pool that covers 175,000 square kilometers, roughly the size of Uruguay. It's the largest freshwater reserve in the world. The water sits on land that has a very slight incline, an imperceptible slope, that continues throughout the whole Paraguay River Basin. Because of this minimal slope, life in the Pantanal depends on the seasons of flooding and drying. The water level rises and falls about three meters. It's like an immense tide but it doesn't come and go every six hours like the tides of the sea, but rather every six months. It's hard to see the water flowing as it moves only about six centimeters per second. There's just one high tide and one low tide each season. But that's the rule that governs here. So the Pantanal is a wetland but it's not always wet, or at least not in the entirety of its territory. And that has forced its inhabitants to develop unique evolutionary adaptations in order to be able to survive in the changing environmental conditions of the Pantanal. And now human activity may be causing the alterations in this water cycle to become even bigger, more serious, and more dangerous for everyone. Something really strange is happening in the Pantanal. 
Nobody is sure exactly when it began to occur, but there are certain special isolated years when the waters don't rise as they normally do, as is expected in the yearly cycle. This is one of those very rare years, a dry year with no rising tide. In addition to these exceptional droughts, a trend has also become evident. Decade after decade, the water level is clearly dropping. It's a fact that with each passing year, there is less water in the Pantanal. What are the reasons for this ecological drama? The combination of global warming and deforestation has formed a perfect storm, and it's obvious that together they're weakening this ecosystem. But it may also be true that the higher temperatures and lower annual rainfall aren't having as big an impact on the inhabitants of the Pantanal as the lack of good environmental management. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations organization that follows the disturbing evolution of the planet's climate, every decade from 1850 up to the present has been warmer than the previous one. Finding clean water is like finding a treasure. Bathing and above all drinking is more and more difficult. These toucans have a private water reserve 40 meters above the ground. What's more, the period from 1983 to 2012 has probably been the warmest 30-year period in the last 1,400 years. And when we have updated figures through today, they will almost certainly confirm that trend. As the planet gradually warms, the temperature of the sea's surface waters rises. This oceanic warming, which in the eastern Pacific is called the El Nino phenomenon, is considered the greatest cause of the rise in the atmospheric temperature in its area of influence. As the ocean's temperatures rise, the atmosphere's ability to trap water vapor and condense it into rain is reduced. The proximity of the Pandanal to both the Atlantic and the Pacific, two enormous oceans, makes it extremely vulnerable to the effects of the increase in oceanic temperatures, especially as regards rain patterns. And it's precisely that rain pattern that is causing the terrible cyclical droughts that much of the Pantanal suffers in years like this one. The rain isn't falling at least not where it should. And that's causing more and more severe droughts. And every 10 or 20 years or so, there's a strange extreme drought, which we are still unable to predict, like the one happening this year, which is forcing many to leave the Pantanal. But there's another problem in addition to oceanic warming. The environmental damage that we're causing in the Amazon has adverse effects on the climate of the Pantanal. The increase in deforestation in the Amazonian forest is also contributing to the lack of rain here. 
And according to the Brazilian government's official data, the rate of deforestation in 2018 is the highest of the decade. There is a relationship of direct dependence between the two ecosystems, the flying rivers. The amount of humidity that trees return to the air is tremendous. A tree with a crown measuring 20 meters in diameter can evaporate 1,000 liters of water a day. The 400 billion trees in the Amazon River Basin generate immense currents that transport humidity. They're known as flying rivers. The trade winds move evaporated seawater and add it to the humidity that emerges from the forest. It's estimated that every day the trees in Brazil's forests send some 20 trillion liters of water into the atmosphere. And all that water travels through the air, channeled by the Andes to the south to the Pantanal. Now we can understand how cutting down massive amounts of trees in one place is affecting another place. The water hasn't risen the three meters to its usual level this year, nor have the rivers overflowed their banks. Naturally, this implies very serious consequences. The most significant one is that many animals that depend on fish for food can't raise their young in seasons like this one. If the water doesn't spread out, the fish, which are the essential nutritional base of the fauna in the Pantanal, can't either. So in addition to being hot and thirsty, the animals will go hungry. They may not die, but they certainly won't be able to provide food for a new generation in these conditions. Full and satiated bellies are needed for the hormones to encourage species to undertake the demanding task of reproduction. Making an effort, running risks, without having sufficient guarantees of success would be inefficient. And evolution seeks a biological return on such investment. The parents take on the jobs of incubating, raising, feeding, and caring for their little ones if they're going to survive and then do the same thing for their own young. It's written in their genes. No matter how strong the reproductive instinct may be, without a good fish fillet in their stomachs, most water birds won't go ahead with bringing offspring into the world. This pair of jabirus is occupying their old nest from previous years. They're nervously preening their feathers, perhaps because they don't know what else to do. They should be fishing. And above all, like the rest of the waterbird family, they should be breeding. At this stage of the year, they should be mating or even incubating their eggs already. But the nest is empty, and they aren't showing any sexual activity. They don't have the energy to breed. This pair of strange storks, with stretchable necks as odd as this year's drought, is a sad example of what happens when evolution encounters changes that are too fast. The storks, which are so famous for bringing babies, won't even be bringing their own young this year. Although that doesn't mean that evolution stops. Some animals don't depend on fish to feed their little ones. This woodpecker is bringing food to his mate while she broods their eggs far from the ground. 
insects aren't scarce yet. There may be different kinds of arthropods on the menu, but they haven't felt any restriction so far. They have a sophisticated sonar system to detect succulent larvae and insects in branches and tree trunks. Animals have very powerful tools with which to adapt to environmental changes. All the water birds that live here have been forced to adapt to the dry and wet cycles that alternate in an unpredictable way in the Pantanal. So they've developed very different body shapes and hunting techniques so as to increase their chances for survival and those of their family beyond that of the species. Some fish as they walk. Others are tall and have slender necks that are almost telescopic in order to see farther. Some are slow and some are quick. Others barely move, while many employ the technique of freezing like statues so that their underwater prey don't detect them and reveal themselves. Some have learned how to stir up the muddy bottom with their beaks and feet and walk in a group to find those who hide by burying themselves. And they don't catch just fish, but also snakes or frogs or baby caimans. Among the many strategies that they have explored in this changing setting, where the fish sometimes disappear, a crucial one has been to modify their diet. That's why here one can see beaks in every shape, long or short, wide or flat, according to the most characteristic prey on each menu. There are also curved beaks, which are the best kind to take the shells off giant snails. Although that's a very elaborate technique that requires training. The youngsters have to watch what the adults do very closely to be successful. To paraphrase the old saying, in the Pantanal, if the drought doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Herons are carnivorous, fundamentally fish-eating birds. But some species are optimizing their digestive systems to also be able to take advantage of certain plant material as food. Evolution normally needs millions of years to select and perfect its steps. But in these sanctuaries, it can act almost quickly, such that very big changes can take place in only a few generations. This heron species hasn't just stopped eating fish or other aquatic animals, but has definitively abandoned the water as its habitat. It has specialized in hunting insects on land. Its curious, almost funny movements, which would be unimaginable in any other heron, help it to locate the grasshoppers and beetles that may be hiding in the grass. By moving like this, it makes them jump to try to get away, and that way they reveal themselves to the bird. For an animal to change its shape and behavior this much, the environment has to have exerted a lot of pressure on it. Herons, egrets, and bitterns continue to adapt, evolving in an environment that is becoming hostile to them. Increasingly hostile. The Pantanal is a place at the vanguard of evolution. Here, all the species, both plant and animal, are pushed to the limits of their abilities, of their endurance. 
And as has always happened, in the face of difficulties, only some are chosen to survive. Even though that means that many, the immense majority, have to die. But that's precisely why reproduction includes so many extra individuals. So that in extreme conditions, when life is put to the test, there are enough chances that an individual will emerge that is able to withstand the environmental changes and spread a new line of chromosomes. When faced with situations of maximum environmental stress, the genetic codes undergo variations, even mutations, which sometimes work. And whoever carries those changes, those improvements, lives and reproduces better. Life has always managed to blaze a new trail, to follow the rhythms that nature has imposed on it, which on occasion have been frenetic. Nonetheless, the effects of human progress, especially in the Pantanal, may be too demanding. It could be devastating. We are boosting the already extreme rain patterns of this ecosystem, in addition to contributing to raising the average temperatures. As if that weren't enough, the history of human exploitation of the Pantanal over the last 40 years has multiplied the size of the problem and complicated its solution. It's not always easy to distinguish between what's natural and what's man's fault as regards ecological impact. But our extensive agriculture and ranching are a very obvious kind of threat, particularly because of the large expanses of land needed to carry them out. In fact, as large as possible. And the curious thing about the Pantanal, compared to other savannas like those in Africa, is that here the vegetation has low nutritional value. It has less nitrogen, and that's the essential element that allows the large herds of gnus, zebras, and antelopes to eat in Africa. But not here. Here the deer are rather more solitary. They don't gather in large groups, because they'd starve to death. The Pantanal isn't the ideal place for domestic cattle either. The pasture here is low quality. But the great flood of 1974 caused the bottom to drop out of the land prices in the Pantanal. While the later rapid growth of the Brazilian economy allowed many farmers from other parts of the country to acquire these lands and profit from them without any consideration for sustainability. They were people who had no emotional relationship with the place. They were labeled asphalt farmers because they came from cities like Sao Paulo or Cuiabá, where land prices were prohibitive. Here, they could make a bigger profit on their investments, squeezing the resources of the Pantanal to the maximum without worrying about the long-term welfare of the ecosystem. Today, cattle and soy are the two main exports from this region, and many people have benefited from them. It's essential to establish an exploitation framework for the Pantanal that will keep it from disappearing. This truly is a place of special biological interest. These natural riches can also be exploited in the form of tourism, as in Costa Rica or a large part of Africa, where wildlife is the engine driving another big industry, a source of energy for some more modern societies. This is a paradise for water birds, and also for many other bird species. So it's an extraordinary destination for bird watchers. One of the tourist groups most given to traveling according to the biological riches in each place. 
even now, without proper promotion, it's not unusual to see these curious naturalists with their binoculars around here. But there's a lot more than feathers in the Pantanal. Sometimes you merely have to look at the ground, at little things, to find incredible treasures. Army ants are animals that have starred in several horror films. They're the classic monster that strikes terror into the heart of anyone who doesn't really know them. Supposedly, they can reach such huge numbers that they darken the soil as far as the eye can see. And they devour everything in their path. But normally, they eat small animals that they surround with their armies. The legends say that they have killed people who were wounded or asleep. And supposedly, they leave little more than their bones in a matter of seconds. These are exaggerations, or very rare cases. Even a tarantula can escape by running away if it acts calmly doesn't excite the ants and waits for the right moment. Army ants never stop marching. This species doesn't build anthills like other ants, where they can store food or raise their young. Army ants are always on the road. They're nomads. That makes them a species that can adapt magnificently to changing surroundings. And that turns out to be crucial in a year like this one, with no flooding. As they don't need a fixed place to live, they can extend their range to look for whatever they need until they find food. They can spend one or two days in the same place, or several weeks. It depends on the amount of food they have at their disposal or on the water level. But above all else, like all other ants, army ants have to keep their queen safe. Her reproductive mission is the colony's main objective. That's why every time they stop, they form a home for her and the larvae. The worker ants and the soldier ants build a structure by latching their mandibles onto another's legs. And that's how they form walls and corridors. This technique allows them to settle wherever is best for them at each given time. Army ants don't worry about the ecosystem. They behave in ways motivated exclusively by their self-interest, by hunger, but they act like a buffer in the ecosystem. The size of their colonies adjusts to the surrounding conditions and the available resources, although we may be seeing the most radical changes that have occurred here. It's impossible to predict how life in the Pantanal will react in the coming decades, but the most likely thing is that things will change. And those changes will harm many animals. They'll be forced to leave the region or will be killed off, but they will also benefit some species. Life is like energy. In reality, it's a kind of energy and it doesn't disappear easily. What it does is change shape. In principle, the most basic life forms adapt more easily and quickly. They're more prolific, and natural selection acts on a larger number of individuals in each generation. The most specialized species face greater risks when their habitat undergoes changes. Many are threatened with extinction in the Pantanal. Monkeys, like people, using their intelligence and varying their behavior, can defend themselves and perhaps endure, for example, 
when faced with a lack of water. Any small body of water becomes a spot frequented by both predators and prey. So drinking and bathing are increasingly dangerous as water gets harder and harder to find. This curious way of drinking isn't the result of a direct adaptation to the drought cycles. Although the water is more germ-free and very well oxygenated, water that tastes better and doesn't upset its stomach as stagnant water can. No, for this little monkey, it's above all a matter of safety. All the ponds are booby-trapped. The capuchin monkeys have been forced to keep their distance from the caimans. And it's not at all easy to detect when they're present. They drift like fallen tree trunks. They cover themselves with plants. And they're always stalking something, half submerged and motionless, with far more patience than any mammal. But on the other hand, they're not very clever. Every form of life has its own adaptive tools. The caiman is a specialist in fasting. It can go for months without eating a single thing. They're a very sustainable biological machine. They spend almost every minute of their lives motionless, soaking up the sunlight to warm their blood without spending hardly any energy, waiting for their chance. And they're just as happy catching a monkey as a snake. The caiman's survival abilities are perfect for when the droughts last longer than usual or when one drought runs into another. In reality, Today, the Cayman is once again the king of the Pantanal. It's estimated that some 10 million Caymans may live here now. Nonetheless, even that high number doesn't necessarily guarantee their survival. Humans killed millions of them just in the 1980s. We wanted their hides, until the international prohibition against hunting them was established in 1992. The species recovery speaks well of nature's ability to regenerate itself. But at times, the impact of progress reaches unbearable proportions. One way to protect the caimans and all those who live around them would be to include them within the system of progress. Perhaps this animal could become one of the main focuses of tourist interest in the Pantanal. Tourism could be a solution to the ecological threat. Another emblematic facet of this exotic setting is its ambient sounds, its soundtrack, if you will. The Pantanal is surprisingly noisy. Insects, birds, and amphibians form the main choir, but it's a mammal that sings the solo. It's one of a kind. The howler monkey. 
Its ability to communicate with other groups kilometers away prevents fights between clans. Its skull, and especially its lower jaw, works like a magnificent sound box. And anyone who hears it never forgets it. It's both startling and moving. Although maybe the sound the greatest number of people would come here to listen to is another less raucous but more impressive sound. It's a deep roar made by a cat that weighs 90 kilograms and has the loveliest fur in the world. On moonless nights, it's relatively easy to hear the music of a jaguar, the onsa. The key to African tourism has been the lion. Visiting a place that is home to an animal that's able to kill a human being is different from stopping at any other destination. And it's not essential to see them. Just knowing that they're there is enough to create an atmosphere that no other trip can. The jaguar is in a difficult situation because human progress is stealing its natural habitat, but even more so because nobody wants to live next to a jaguar. Even though jaguar attacks on humans are very rare, the big cats are killed more out of fear than for their fur. If we could convince those who live near them that preserving them would contribute to improving the quality of life in society in the future, we could almost certainly save them, along with their habitat. Anacondas, piranhas, or butterflies, the riches of this landscape, or what's the same thing, its potential for the tourism industry is unsurpassable. Although the truth is that not all the inhabitants of the Pantanal are so attractive for visitors. The presence of poisonous snakes and dangerous insects and spiders means that the adventure of coming to discover these flooded lands should only be undertaken with great care. It's no more dangerous than traveling to the jungles of Asia or the African savanna, but it is a place that can be hostile. No one should walk these paths unless they respect its rules and its people. But it's an adventure, and that's also very appealing. Although army ants are harmless insects with a very bad reputation, fire ants, on the other hand, are relatively unknown creatures that can cause serious problems if you don't know where they live. There's a kind of tree that grows in the jungly part of the Pantanal that bears a curious name, the Novateiro. The interior of its branches is hollow, and a certain kind of ant lives in those tunnels, the Formiga Novateira. The Novateiro tree and the Novateira ant. The name comes from novato, which means novice in Spanish and Portuguese. All the locals know that just touching one is enough for the ants to feel threatened. And this species has a stinger and venom like those of a wasp. The tree is well protected from herbivores by a merciless horde of tiny warriors. If anybody wanders into an area of novatado trees without realizing it, they can end up being stung by far too many ants at one time. The capuchin monkeys, the ones that learned how to drink from the roots of the aquatic plants, have also learned how to eat Novateda ants. They live on these trees, and their fur helps to protect them from insects, but they're not immune to their venom. To eat this delicacy, which must seem deliciously spicy to them, 
or very rich in some nutrient, the monkeys have to wait for certain cold days in the month of July, when the temperatures dip exceptionally to seven or eight degrees Celsius, and the insects can barely move. Then the ants become easy prey for this intelligent and very adaptable animal. It's a question of survival. And as always, some survive at the cost of others, implacably, with no responsibility. Taking advantage of the one that's in a weaker position, that's the law of life in the wild. Some use the cold, while others even find it useful that the Pantanal is drying out. Opportunists like the greater Rhea adjust well to the plains stripped of trees and shrubs after cattle have grazed there. These parrots have also arrived from the south. They're colonizers that increase their efficiency in the new conditions of the Pantanal. They occupy the new ecological niche and force others, those who suffer the consequences of the changes, to leave or to go extinct or to evolve. We also force other animals to change, but the presence of human beings can't be considered completely negative either. Our presence changes. It alters everything. It destabilizes what there was. It destroys things but it also writes new rules for the future. And other species will prosper, even if only the ones that coexist with us. We're like the meteorite that killed off the dinosaurs. The life forms that survive our impact will be the ones that accompany us. Rodents, seagulls, cockroaches, and termites, for the most part. Or do we want something else? something more. Survival should take into account all species as a whole. Some of us depend on others. Everything is connected. Created so that people could cross the Pantanal safely, the Transpantaneda Road is a mound of earth 145 kilometers long with 127 wooden bridges. It traverses the Pantanal from the city of Pocone to Porto Jofre to the south. But for the moment, that's where the road ends. It's a main artery that allows tourists to enter the wetlands with a degree of comfort and safety. Its simple construction and maintenance are reasonable, sustainable as we say today. It's vital for the transport of the supplies needed by the first country inns to set up shop along the road. The business of eco-accommodations is up and running. Nonetheless, barely 2% of this vast territory enjoys any kind of institutional protection. The Pantanal was declared a biosphere reserve by the UNESCO in the year 2000. But that status still hasn't been implemented properly. In fact, the Pantanal almost lost that classification in 2017 because of a lack of political commitment. We can't afford to allow the Pantanal to run the same fate as the jungles of the Iguazu to the south, which practically disappeared as they were cut down for wood. Some of the governments of the three countries that are home to the Pantanal are making an effort to do what they can, but they have few resources at their disposal. Ecology seems like a luxury only for the rich, but probably the fastest and most efficient strategy to preserve something is to make it profitable. That's to say, to incorporate it in the system. Today, everything has to work. 
offering the Pantanal to tourists is a good option to guarantee its protection. But that alone isn't enough. Today, more than a million people a year already visit this ecosystem. The vast majority of those people appreciate nature and wildlife and behave appropriately. But uncontrolled tourism could also bring trouble. Massive numbers of visitors anywhere not only destroys what attracts people to an area in the first place, but in the end, it has effects similar to those of farming or ranching. If tourism were to grow uncontrollably, human settlements would also increase. The local population would be displaced and other conflicts would emerge. Before creating new infrastructure, the way in which this natural treasure can be shown to the world must be regulated. Similar experiences have been carried out on other continents and they have yielded both positive results and negative results. By learning from others' mistakes, an appropriate management system could be designed, which, with preservation as its main goal, would enable a tourism program that wouldn't interfere with the Pantanal's wildlife or its natural ecological cycles. And, of course, development of the tourism industry must be accompanied by environmental education and awareness programs for the local population. Costa Rica and Tanzania could serve as great examples of how people and businesses can adapt to make ecology an attractive and valuable asset. We must act responsibly out of an awareness of our footprint on the planet. We will always put our own survival before that of other species. Logically, naturally, that's what all other species would do. It's what termites and caimans do. But we are also able to reason. We have the ability to look ahead in time to the future. And we also enjoy beauty. So we are able to appreciate the paradises around us. Our existence in terms of both quality and quantity depends on the whole array of species that accompany us. Taking care of the world as it is now is also protecting ourselves.